Oh, hello, you've caught me watching the Harry Potter movies on Blu-ray because, you know, it's getting cold now. The nights are drawing in and I need something warm and familiar to get me through these barren months of nothing between now and Christmas. Well, what about all the amazing games that come out literally every October? Shh! Doesn't fit in with my narrative. And my narrative is this. Sometimes we love things maybe a bit too much. Like, I know the Harry Potter movies aren't everyone's cup of tea, and sometimes the acting's a bit Final Fantasy X. <laughs> but I think they're magical, okay? And I will watch them all every year around this time until I die. We've all got those guilty pleasures, haven't we? Films, music, books and games that are never going to serve tidal waves of critical approval, but we love them anyway because they've just got that special something about them. Here are seven games we loved maybe a little bit more than they deserved. And since we're talking the boy wizard, our first entry is none other than Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on PS1. I got this for Christmas right after the first movie came out, when Potter fever was at its height, when people were coming to school non-uniform days dressed as witches and wizards, and when Fantastic Beasts was in its rightful place as an in-universe textbook no one really cared about. I remember unwrapping this beauty on Christmas Day and just swelling with giddy excitement. Harry Potter, Harry Potter, oh my god, more Harry Potter! I launched upstairs, scattering tinsel and chocolate selection boxes everywhere, my other presents forgotten, jammed that disc into the PS1, and then just let the magic hit me. Welcome to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. I am Albus Dumbledore, your headmaster. It was an all-time great Christmas day, that was, like, easily in my top three. By the time the turkey was ready, I'd already earned gold wings in Madame Hooch's Quidditch tryouts, beaten Peeves, the pesky poltergeist, who was cut from the movies, probably rightfully so, in a ridiculous race across obstacles that didn't really make much architectural sense, but then hey, Hogwarts, it's magic, isn't it? Controlled a roller coaster minecart through the dark vaults of Gringotts Bank, collecting coins, some careless witch or wizard had Wingardium leviosa all over the place, and beaten Malfoy, Crab and Goyle in a tense boss battle which involved hurling crackers at each other for ten minutes. Okay, so some strange decisions were made during the development of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, but crucially, the magic was there. I'm using the word magic in lieu of that inarticulable feeling I got when staying up until the early hours reading the books in my teens. The same feeling I got sitting in the back of a sold out cinema in 2001 and hearing the first few notes of John Williams' now iconic Harry Potter theme actually called Hedwig's theme, I know, don't worry, people in the comments. And so it didn't really matter that PS1 Dumbledore looked like a kind letterbox, or Hagrid a pie that hadn't quite risen properly, because I was there, in Hogwarts, going to classes and collecting Bertie Bott's every flavour beans and playing Quidditch. I love this game, and I don't care what anyone else says. Game came out, Robert? Yeah, so? <laughs> oh, God. Next on my list is underappreciated PS2 cult classic Jade Cocoon 2, a game I adored back in the day. Now, I know many of you will probably have never heard of Jade Cocoon 2, and that's okay, nobody's perfect. And I know those of you who have heard of it will likely be going, but Jade Cocoon 1 was way better, you idiot! Why not include that one? Because I never played Jade Cocoon 1, okay? It still hurts. I played a demo of Jade Cocoon 1 about 50 times, but that was at a time when I had no spending power of my own. You know, I couldn't just go out and buy the full game. Then, when I got my first Saturday job aged 16 and was raking in as much as £120 a month, 
three new games a month, basically, and that is literally what I spent the money on. You didn't pay me any rent, did you, you ungrateful swine? I went out and saw Jake Kuhn 2 on the shelf. Instantly, my mind was catapulted back to that demo I loved, and so I bought the game then and there, and it was amazing. Turn-based monster battling heaven. I got so into building my ultimate beast hunter dream team, I'd be up all hours of the night scribbling down my desired monsters, what moves I wanted them to have and deciding on the most efficient way of levelling them up to the point where they could evolve. You had to fuse beasts together in order for them to evolve fully to their ultimate form and working out what beasts were compatible and then waiting for that magical moment when they transformed was just amazing. And battling other beast hunters was great as well. The music was cool. Just wow. Honestly, if in some magical universe where everyone likes the same things I do, they announced a Jade Cocoon 3, it would instantly be at the top of my most anticipated list. I love this game so much. Entry 3. Okay, let me know in the comments if you've ever heard of or played Dragon Valor a sort of sequel slash remake of the original Dragon Buster, which never made it to PlayStation. Dragon Valor did, however, and despite the fact it got a critical mauling, I sort of love it. It's a simple game, get through the levels, hit the bad guys, kill the boss. But I really enjoyed the deliberate purity of the combat. It was almost mathematical. You know, one of those games where once you'd played it enough, You'd know exactly how long each attack took to prepare and execute, and therefore exactly when to use it, almost like you were seeing the code. And so carving my way through Dragon Valor was almost therapeutic for me. It had a really interesting story too, with three possible endings, which at the time was like, oh my god, three endings! In each chapter, you'd have to make a choice, resulting in a different playable character for the next chapter. The story follows three generations of the same family, and so you get to experience the thrill of seeing your previous exploits cemented into in-game legend. It looks a bit clunky now, sure, but there was a rawness and simplicity to Dragon Valor I really appreciated. After strategizing my way through countless JRPGs, it was nice to just sit back and hit things with a sword. Plus, the Crystal Knights made a really funny noise when you killed them. I mean, it was funny when I was 13, okay? Ninja Shadow of Darkness is next, the game my dad got me after trading in Tomb Raider 3 on my behalf when I couldn't figure out how to get past the first bloody level. Ninja Shadow of Darkness is a game I respect. I never finished it, I wasn't good enough. But then it was one of those games you never expected to finish, like when you go down the arcade with a pocket full of coins and optimism just to see how far you can get. Ninja was old school. You had lives and not very many of them and when you ran out of lives, that was it. It was game over. Like actually game over, as in start again please, you've properly died. And so if you got your ass kicked by a boss it wasn't like today where you can just try and try again until you stumble your way through, no. If you wanted another crack you had to have some lives spare and start from the last checkpoint, otherwise it was just back to level 1. This difficulty gave a razor edge to every combat scenario. You knew one mistake would be costly, especially early on. You knew you had to do everything perfectly because you'd need to save your lives for later. I didn't mind starting Ninja from the beginning every time though because A, I absolutely loved the CG intro. Epic setup involving a very evil demon and some incredible music. And also, I really liked kicking these guys' hats off in the opening area. Brilliant. They don't make them like this anymore, etc, etc. Our fifth entry is The Legend of Dragoon, a game widely adored by many people with discerning taste, but panned by critics when it initially released on PS1 in the UK in 2001, 
because it tried too hard to be Final Fantasy. I mean, yeah, it's a 100 hour epic JRPG over four discs and back in 2001, Final Fantasy practically owned the 100 hour epic JRPG over four discs genre. Yes, The Legend of Dragoon was a bit derivative, yes, the translation was a bit wobbly here and there, but come on, this game is underrated. If someone asked me to give them a quick pitch, I'd have to say, imagine a Golden Age Final Fantasy game starring Power Rangers who morph into Dragon Warriors instead of colour-coded martial artists in spandex. What is not to like about that? Some people didn't like the additions in combat, attacks that test your timing and reactions, but those people are wrong and need to get good. The additions were cool, the Dragoon attacks were cool, the story was ace, the boss music was amazing. The cliches were all my favourite ones, you know, a hero from a leafy village that gets burned down by a high ranking villain who ends up as the boss at the end of disc one, a hero whose dad is the baddie but not really because he was actually being possessed by the real baddie all along, hero with a childhood sweetheart who turns out to be some kind of celestial chosen one, an anti-love interest with a shady past, a big guy with an axe, a bad guy with silver hair, a yuffie alike with silver hair, and literally Cyan from Final Fantasy VI. Okay, so they blatantly copied Cyan, but whatever, Hashel is cool. Whenever I mention The Legend of Dragoon, I inevitably get a few messages calling for a remake or a sequel, and if that happened, I would lose my mind. All right, it's not as polished as your Final Fantasies or your Dragon Quests, but flipping heck, it's every bit as epic and immersive. The Legend of Dragoon Army. Let's hear you in the comments. Remake, remake, remake. Entry six is Kingdom Come Deliverance, an RPG so rich and deep you could fall into it forever. Lots of people, like Dave for instance, got put off by the complexity and difficulty, you know. You're playing as a peasant, you can't just go around killing everyone with a sword, at least not at the start. You have to eat food, but not too much food. You have to keep clean, otherwise people won't want to speak to you. You have to really focus in combat, otherwise you will just lose. It's not a big budget Skyrim style blockbuster either, you know, it was kickstarted by fans, so it's a little rough and ready, yes, but when you get in to Kingdom Come Deliverance, you will not be able to think of anything else. It's so huge and immersive and wonderfully slow. You know, I sort of like the way it takes Henry a lot of time and effort to transform himself from turnip haggling nobody into shining hero of the people and genuinely charming and funny too. The whole thing bubbling with cheeky personality and crucially, no magic whatsoever. This isn't a fantasy game, it's a historically accurate RPG set in 15th century mainland Europe and chronicles real events, places and people. Look how beautifully muted and natural that colour palette is. No sunsets for the sake of sunsets, no dramatic lighting, just brownie greens and mud. Lovely, real, squelchy looking mud. Like many games on this list, Kingdom Come Deliverance received a lot of sevens and eights from critics and yes, it's not without its faults. But honestly, it's one of the best seven out of tens I've ever played. There's a magic to it, ironically, that keeps drawing me back in. An RPG for hardcore RPG lovers. If you like the Elder Scrolls and are a bit of a history buff, get this played. You will not regret it. Okay, final entry. Now, Metal Gear Solid 2 is often regarded as the worst one, you know the runt of the Metal Gear litter. There are many reasons for this. The mad plot, Raiden, the mad plot, the whole underwater bit, the mad plot, the naked sneaking around Arsenal gear and the mad plot being just a few. Whenever anyone ranks their favourite Metal Gears, inevitably they'll take a deep breath, put on their cleverest face and then say something like, hmm, uh hmm, for me, it's got to be three, then one, then five, then four, 
and then two, mm, two, oh, oh, I don't like two. Two's rubbish. Who would like Metal Gear Solid 2? Mm. Two is silly, they'll hoot. The plot makes no sense and Ocelot's betraying so many different people he doesn't even know who he's working for himself. Well, guess what? I like the mad plot. I loved the shocking reveal of how the Patriots were secretly controlling everything, about how far-reaching their power was. The story folds in on itself so many times towards the end you could probably stab someone with it, but I sort of loved the madness. I loved Campbell going all weird at the end and spoilers turning out to be an AI. You know, I loved the whole mad fish and mailed bit and all the dramatic story reveals. Then where's the new Metal Gear? Right here. What? You're standing in it. Oh man, that bit was great. The realization that the entire setting for the game was just surface camouflage for a Metal Gear the size of a small village sent my 16-year-old just seen the Matrix Reloaded brain into overdrive. And then the kicker, the revelation to end all revelations, post-credits, the Patriots' terrifying dominance established, Otacon and Snake, spoilers obviously. Did you find the Patriots' list? Of course. It contains the personal data of 12 people. Where are they? Well, we were right about them being on Manhattan, but... But what? They're already dead. All 12 of them. When did it happen? Well, uh, about a hundred years ago. What the hell? Metal Gear Solid 2 is bonkers, but my god, it's amazing. That intro, that music, those graphics that preposterously still look good 17 years later. The action set pieces, vamp, the sword fight on top of Federal Hall, the rain-soaked shootout with Olga. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And besides all that, it was more than just a game. It was a sequel about the nature of sequels. It explored nature versus nurture, censorship, a growing societal fear the old analog world was being swept away by a digital tidal wave. Games didn't and still don't tackle themes like this. It was brave and bold and new, and I bloody loved it. And just so we're clear, the actual order goes one, three, two, four, five. Don't at me. So there we go, seven games we love maybe a little bit more than they deserve, but not really because they're amazing. Do you agree with this list? Have you got any others you'd like to add? Let us know in the comments, leave us a like if you enjoyed the video, and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all of our content. Thanks for watching, and see you next week. For the players.